Let's go ahead and get started. It's my great pleasure to introduce PSU alum, um, Dr. Ryan Estep. Got his undergraduate degree here in biology. Biology. Yeah. And this got his PhD then at OHSU. So if possible, you can get an undergrad here and then uh, do a PhD at OHSU. He's now working at the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute at the West Campus of OHSU, uh, working on herpes viruses. And I thought to myself, he's working on them. He probably knows way more about them than I do. So <laughs> why not let him do the lecture today? So without further ado. All right. Thank you. It's always fun to come back and talk to this class, having been a graduate of this actual class, which I did the math and it was 20 years ago this year, so I can't believe it's been that long, but here I am speaking to you guys about some of the same things that I learned, so it's kind of a privilege to be back here. Um, so as Ken mentioned, I work on herpes, herpes viruses. Um, and to start with, when you tell people you work on herpes viruses, usually they laugh at you and say, you work on herpes? You know, they always think of things like this where, you know, you're getting bad diseases from people. Um, scientists like to have fun with it too, though. This is actually a t-shirt that was made for a scientific conference that was here in Portland many years ago. I didn't get one, unfortunately, but I don't have herpes, but I'm working on it, so haha. <laughs> -ha. Um, but one of the things I like people to take away from when I talk to them about herpes is that herpes viruses encompass more than just herpes that everybody thinks about. So what are herpes viruses? Um, the <coughs> word comes from the Greek word herpian, which means to creep, which is a reference to the, to the appearance of the spreading skin lesions that some people get. Um, they're prevalent pathogens of humans and animals. And there's at least one known herpes virus that's been associated with most species examined to date. So they're, they're very prevalent. And they've closely evolved with their host species. So that's kind of an interesting thing about these viruses is that how closely they've evolved with us as a virus. Um, generally, they cause mild infections, um, but sometimes they can cause more severe disease, which we'll talk a bit more about. And the interesting thing about these viruses is that they are capable of establishing this lifelong latent infection in their host. That they're, once they're in you, they're in you for the rest of your life. So they belong to the order herpes virilis, which was more recently established, and this is broken down into three different families, the herpes viridae, the alloherpes viridae, and the malaco herpes viridae. Uh, the herpes viridae is the largest family that infects mammals, birds, and reptiles, and probably more relevant to us as humans. And then this is broken down into three subfamilies, the alpha, alpha herpes virini, the beta herpes virini, and the gamma herpes virini. And these are all grouped together into these subfamilies based on biological properties and genome organization. Uh, the alphas have more neurotropism, a relatively short replication cycle. The betas have a longer replication cycle and infect things like liporeticular cells while the gamma infect cells like lymphocytes and can cause cancer in humans. So there are eight known human herpes viruses. Um, and if you look at the different human herpes viruses broken down into the different subfamilies, we have HHV1 and HHV2, which are also known as herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. HSV1 causes, of course, uh, cold sores, um, oral facial lesions um, we're all familiar with. And then HSV2 is the, the nasty one that everybody thinks of when they think of herpes, which causes genital lesions and sexually transmitted disease. <coughs> and then there's also the varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox or varicella, and then later in life can reactivate to cause shingles or zoster. Um, looking at the beta herpes viruses, um, one of these is um, HHV5, which is cytomegalovirus, which is generally a benign infection that a lot of people get. It's generally asymptomatic, but it can cause fetal abnorm or abnormalities if it's associated with a congenital infection. And it can also cause other diseases in those with weakened immune systems. Um, and then kind of lumped together the HHV6 and HHV7, which are known as the roseola viruses, which also commonly infect children and can cause uh, febrile illness and rashes. Um, which is also another common virus that a lot of people get. Uh, looking at the gamma herpes viruses, the most well-known is uh, Epstein-Barr virus, HHV4, which causes mono. Um, it can also cause cancers, again, lymphoma and carcinoma in some, in some people. And then the most recently uh, identified human herpes virus, which is Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, or KSHV, which is something that our lab is interested in. Um, we actually study this in an animal model. Um, and this virus causes Kaposi sarcoma and B-cell lymphomas. So if we just look at the prevalence of the human herpes viruses, just kind of a general um, rate of infection, 
looking at the alphas, HSV1 is around anywhere from 50 to 70% of us have this virus. HSV2 can be from anywhere from 20 to 50%. VZV is higher, around 85 to 95%. <clears throat> and then looking at the beta herpes viruses, CMV is anywhere from 40 to 70, HSV6 and 7, between 60 to 100% of us have been infected at some point. And then the gamma herpes viruses, EBV, uh, is around 80 to 95%, uh, while with KSHV, it's, it's much more uh, uncommon, it's very rare, it's more common in AIDS patients, so this one isn't really um, well established in the population. And again, these all cause relatively mild infections for the most part, um, usually if you have an outbreak of, of cold sore, it usually resolves itself and goes away. Um, more complications are often associated with those that are immunosuppressed, AIDS patients, transplant recipients, um, elderly, et cetera. Um, and again, once you have this, uh, these viruses, they, they're with you for the rest of your life, so they're always in your body. So what are some of the similarities and differences between the herpes viruses? Uh, their variant structures are all similar. Um, their entry, replication, and assembly mechanisms are all essentially the same. Um, they all have a general genome structure that's similar. And they possess this core group of proteins, around 25 proteins, that display some similarity through all the herpes viruses. Uh, these are generally involved in things like genome replication, um, like DNA polymerase, and structural proteins like capsid proteins. So those are really, really well conserved among the different herpes viruses. And the largest variability seems to occur in the numerous other genes that are specific to each virus group, uh, which kind of help determine the unique properties of each virus, um, the cell types they infect, the hosts they infect, and the associated diseases with each virus. So when we study uh, herpes viruses, generally we look at HSV-1 as the model, the prototypical herpes virus. It's the one that's most is known about. It's been the most extensively studied of the herpes viruses. And again, it shares basic properties with all herpes viruses, so it's, it's kind of an easy way to look at the general herpes virus life cycle when we look at HSV-1. And again, similar genome structure, virion structure, infection mechanisms, et cetera. So if we look at the virion structure of HSV-1, these viruses are all enveloped, icosahedral capsid um, viruses. The capsids are constructed from about six proteins, uh, the major constituent being the major capsid protein, um, VP5, uh, which forms the 162 capsomers. And then the diameter of a fully enveloped virion is around 200 nanometers. Um, the envelope out here on the outside contains um, transmembrane viral glycoproteins. There's at least 10 for HSV-1. These are called um, glycoprotein C or GC, GD, et cetera. They're all labeled with a, a letter. And they appear as these spikes on the surface of the viral envelope. And these are required for binding to target cells and infection of target cells. Um, and kind of an interesting thing about herpes viruses is this layer between the capsid and the envelope, which is called the tegument. And it contains at least, at least 14 viral proteins that we know of. Some of these tegument proteins perform immediate functions after the virus gets into the cell, um, two in particular being VP16 or alpha TIF, which is a transcription factor that we'll talk more about. Um, and there's also this VHS, which is the virion host shutoff, which degrades um, mRNA when the virus gets into the cell. The herpes virus genomes are all linear double-stranded DNA genomes of anywhere from around 125 to 290 kilobase pairs, so they're relatively big viruses. They can encode anywhere from around 80 to 200 genes. Um, they contain both unique sequence regions and these interesting repeat sequence elements throughout their genomes. The unique sequence regions compose the majority of the genome and contain most of the open reading frames. But the organization of the repeat sequences is kind of what varies the most between the different virus types. Um, and this is just kind of a general overview of, of some of the herpes virus genome structures, looking at the repeat regions, um, examples on the side here being some of the human herpes viruses. So again, they're all linear, uh, double-stranded DNA. <coughs> they contain uh, unique regions um, throughout uh, most of the genome, and then on the ends, they can have these different repeat structures. So looking at HHV6 and 7, they have these two direct repeats. KSHV is a little different. It's got these reiterated short repeats on the ends, um, and then EBV has kind of a similar structure with some internal repeats. And then looking at the alphas is when it gets kind of a little more different with the, um, the end repeats being inverted and flipped and being on the inside of the genome, which causes the genome to be broken up into essentially two um, fragments, the unique long and the unique short. Um, and we'll look at that more in a minute, or now. Um, <laughs> So it's a 150 kilobase uh, linear genome for HSV-1. It encodes at least 84 genes. 
And again, it's divided into these two segments, the long and the short segment. Each of these segments possesses a unique region that's flanked on the ends again by these inverted repeats. Um, the unique long region contains 65 open reading frames, the unique short contains 14. And the repeat regions um, are, are labeled as A, B, um, the N represents one or more copies of this A sequence in tandem. So the A, B sequence is on the left end of the UL here, but it's also flipped and inverted and present on the right end of the UL on this side. And then on the short side, or the short sequence, the A and C uh, flanks this end. The prime indicates that it's inverted relative to the other repeat structure. So basically you have these two repeat structures on each side of the unique short region and these unique um, repeats on the end of the unique long region. And then um, these A sequences are 200 to 500 base pair long sequences that possess signals for genome packaging. So they're important for getting the virus genome into the capsid. Um, and due to the presence of these inverted repeats, um, the HSV1 genome is kind of unique in that it can actually recombine during replication and exist as these four different isoforms in which you have the long, re the long sequence going this direction and the short sequence this direction, but it can also flip um, producing these different isoforms of the genome um, in, in any individual virus. And all four forms of these viral genomes are actually infectious. So the herpes virus genomes, um, when they get into the cell, they also circularize, and this is kind of just depicting a circular genome. Um, the genomes circularize through their A sequences at the end. So this just is a map showing the transcripts and, and genes in HSV1. Um, they're overlapping, they can go different directions. Um, there is splicing in HSV1. Um, not many of the genes are spliced, which we'll talk about more as well. Some of the other viruses have more splicing happening, but for the most part in HSV1, there's really only a few genes that are spliced. Um, and they also have these origins of replication that are important for the genome replicating itself. So again, herpes viruses have these kind of two distinct lifestyles. They can either undergo lytic replication or enter a state of latency in the host. Um, the linear DNA, again, circularizes upon entry via the A sequences. <coughs> And once it's in the nucleus, uh, the virus can then either in initiate lytic replication and make more of itself, or it can basically enter the state of latency. So lytic replication results in the full expression of viral gene products, uh, genome replication, production of and release of infectious progeny, and usually cell destruction. Um, latency, on the other hand, involves the expression of a small subset of latency-specific genes that um, there's no virus being made, and it's just these few genes that are being made, and it kind of keeps the, the genome in the cell, but doesn't allow any virus production to happen. So the, during latency, the genome is then maintained as this circular um, extra chromosomal episome that just kind of stays in the cell um, outside of the genome, um, and then it serves as a potential reservoir for the production of more virus um, in the future. So if we look at a general herpes virus replication cycle, we have binding of the herpes virus particle to the surface, um, release of the capsid travels on microtubules through the cell to the nuclear, mem uh, nuclear membrane, and it docks at a nuclear pore, releases the viral genome into the nucleus, and then you get this cascade gene expression pattern, which we'll go over more as well. Uh, assembly of capsids and packaging, release of the particle, um, transit out of the cell, um, and release of the virus progeny. So the initial step being the binding step, um, how does HSV1 get into the cell? So again, it has all these viral glycoproteins <coughs> at the surface. Um, GC from HSV1 binds to heparin sulfate on the cell surface. That allows it to attach. And then also, also this GD protein binds the herpes virus entry mediator, um, or nectin-1. And the, the HVM molecule is actually identified because it initially was identified as binding to herpes viruses. Nobody knew what it did, but now we know it's a member of the TNF receptor family. Um, but that's where it got its name. So this binding then triggers membrane fusion, which can occur either at the plasma membrane or in endosomes. Um, it also requires other viral glycoproteins, such as GB and this GHGL complex. Um, eventually, the fusion happens. The capsid gets into the nucleus. The capsid again moves along microtubules to reach the nucleus, and then we have release of the genome, along with some of these tegument proteins that I mentioned earlier that are important for getting um, virus um, activated into the cell. So herpes virus transcription, again, um, it's, this is in the, the nucleus of the cell. It utilizes host cell RNA polymerase II. 
Uh, there's viral and cellular transcription factors that, are, that act on viral gene promoters. Uh, the transcripts are processed um, in the nucleus. They get five prime cap. They're polydenylated, spliced. Um, and as I mentioned a bit ago, there's only four HSV1 genes that actually contain uh, introns and are spliced. Um, the splicing, as I said as well, can be more complex than other viruses, um, especially um, from my experience in the gamma herpes viruses, there's all kinds of splicing events going on, um, huge transcripts, multiple genes on individual transcripts. So it can be a lot more messy than what we see with HSV1. Um, so in the end, all of these transcripts, once they're made, are exported to the cytoplasm where they get translated. And the herpes virus, uh, yeah. I'm sorry if I just missed this. Uh, uh -huh. Where's the cap come from? Is it cellular made? Does the yeah, that's all through the cellular RNA polymerase machinery, yeah. I mean, mm. did the virus doesn't? No. Okay. No, it doesn't steal caps or do anything fancy. It just takes the cellular machinery and does its thing, so. Um, so looking at the different classes of herpes virus genes, there's these uh, cascade expression pattern of gene expression. <coughs> we have three different classes of genes. The first being the immediate early, or also the alpha genes. Uh, HSV1 has six early genes. They're ICP0, 4, 22, US125, ICP27, ICP47. The first five of these are factors that promote expression of the early and late viral genes. ICP-47 is the one that's kind of the outlier. Its, its function is to inhibit immune recognition of infected cells, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so essentially, these proteins then go on to activate the early genes, um, and then these genes are mostly involved in things like viral DNA replication, um, nucleotide uh, metabolism, DNA polymerase, et cetera, allowing the virus to replicate its genome. And then after this, we have expression of the late genes, which are the majority of the viral genes. These are, require um, viral DNA replication for their expression, and they can kind of be subdivided into two further classes, gamma-1, which are weakly expressed after the early genes are transcribed, or also known as leaky late genes. And then there's these gamma-2, which are only expressed after replication of the genome begins and are known as strict late genes. Um, and these include things, as you would imagine, as uh, structural proteins like capsid, proteins involved in assembly, but they also include numerous other gene products that are involved in the various processes that each virus needs to establish itself within the cell. <clears throat> so if we just kind of look at this as a, an overview, again, we have immediate early being transcribed. Um, those are activating the early genes. They go on to activate the late genes after viral DNA synthesis has occurred. And there's just kind of this fine-tuned um, mechanism of the early genes activating <coughs> early promoters. Um, ICP4, which is an early gene, actually turns off its own promoter, so it's kind of a way to turn off things that it doesn't need and kind of keep the virus moving through its life cycle. Um, and one of the key mediators of this whole pathway is VP16, um, <clears throat> which binds to the immediate early promoters. Um, so the promoters in the different classes of genes are, are largely different. The immediate early genes have uh, numerous binding sites for cellular transcription factors as well as these viral transcription factors. And then as we move through the other classes, the promoters are kind of different. They're not as dependent on cellular transcription factors. They have different structures. Some of them don't use tata boxes. Some of them use modified tata boxes. So um, there's variability in the different promoters of the genes, and that kind of helps regulate which genes are turned on when. So VP16, um, which again is also known as alpha transinducing factor, or alpha TIF, is a late gene that's packaged into the very integument during assembly. So again, it comes in with the virus, so it's there when the genome gets put into the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> it's a strong transcriptional activator. It's actually probably one of the strongest activators known. It's used widely in molecular biology to study transcriptional regulation. It's used as a uh, control in a lot of experiments because it's able to turn on promoters very well. Um, and it does this by interacting with the cellular um, OCT1 and HCF1 transcription factors, um, which then initiates the complex formation for RNA polymerase II. So through this binding of this complex to the immediate early promoters, it then recruits the polymerase and induces expression <coughs> of uh, the immediate early gene. So looking more closely at the HSV1 immediate early gene locations and their transcription, all six of the alpha genes are located within or near the B and C repeat regions at the uh, ends of the genomes. Uh, the beta and gamma genes, again, are dispersed throughout the genome. Um, <clears throat> three of the alpha genes are spliced, ICP0, 22, and 47. 
Well, only one of the beta gamma genes, UL15 um, in HSV1 is spliced, so that's, again, kind of a difference between some of the other herpes viruses in regards to splicing. Um, some of these genes, uh, ICP0 and ICP4, are located in these repeats, so they're actually present in more than one copy. Whether that's relevant to the biology of the virus or just an artifact of the duplication, nobody really knows, but it's kind of interesting. So what are the functions of some of these immediate early genes? Um, ICP0 relieves the silencing of the beta and gamma genes. Um, ICP4 is an activating transcription factor for the beta and gamma genes. Um, and again, it represses its own promoter. Um, and then ICP22, together with US1.5, is an activator of late gene transcription. And then ICP27 inhibits uh, ICP0, ICP22, and ICP47 splicing. So again, kind of shutting off the early genes and then pushing this, the virus through onto the early gene expression. And then later, it also promotes beta and gamma mRNA translation. So it's kind of a regulator of turning off the early genes and moving this, the, the virus towards early and late gene expression. So once the genome is, is in the cell and we've had expression of immediate early and early genes, the genome replicates. Um, DNA replication, again, only after these genes are expressed. Um, utilizing its own viral DNA polymerase. There are other viral proteins um, that the virus makes that are directly involved in DNA replication. These include the single-stranded DNA binding protein, a processivity factor, a helicase primase complex, and then genes that are involved in nucleotide metabolism, like a thymidine kinase or ribonucleotide reductase, so things that the, the virus needs to kind of induce the cell to replicate its genome. So kind of one of the intriguing things about these polymerases is that they're a common target of antiviral drugs. Um, most clinically useful anti-herpes virus drugs are nucleoside analogs that are uh, preferentially, tar preferentially targeting the viral DNA polymerase. They don't bind as well to the host polymerase. So they essentially uh, uh, get into the cell and terminate DNA elongation for the virus and activate DNA polymerase for the virus and prevent the virus from replicating itself. Um, one of the most widely known is acyclovir, which is predominantly used for HSV and VZV infections. So in this case, the viral thymidine kinase actually, when the drug gets into the cell, phosphorylates it to acyclo-GMP. This again get, gets converted to acyclo-GTP by cellular kinases, and then it gets into the nucleus, uh, associates with the viral DNA polymerase, and essentially terminates chain elongation and replication. So it prevents the virus from replicating the DNA, can't make more virus, the virus doesn't grow. So that's one of the common targets for a herpes virus drug. So lytic DNA replication uh, occurs in the nucleus, as I mentioned, um, and it re again requires the direct activity of these beta or early gene products. And it also involves this rolling circle genome replication mechanism, which is directly coupled with genome packaging into capsids. Um, and this is just a, a list of some of the genes that are involved in um, DNA replication and what they do. <clears throat> so replication can actually begin at any one of the three origins that are on the uh, HSV genome. It doesn't seem to be preferentially targeting any one. Um, initially, there's this bidirectional um, theta structures that form as the, the virus replicates the genome. And this is initiated by origin binding protein, UL9, which binds to the genome and unwinds the DNA. A uh, single-stranded DNA binding protein then binds to the DNA, and then this helicase primase complex binds, adding RNA primers. Uh, the polymerase sits down, and, and the processivity factor bind and extend the primers. And so you kind of get these theta structures that form as the virus begins to replicate in both directions around the circular genome. But then at some point during this event, there's a nicking of one of the strands of DNA, and this essentially induces the rolling circle mechanism um, in which uh, the polymerase just keeps extending the virus genome around in a circle and spinning off more um, head-to-tail concatenators of genome length units of, uh, of, of viral genome. So, and then at some point, the scaffold forms, uh, it associates with the DNA. The DNA is cleaved um, after it's being um, packaged into the virine. It gets cleaved at these A signals, um, which contain these PAC1 and PAC2 sequences specifically that are important for cleavage. Um, <clears throat> and the scaffold involves these three late, um, late proteins and empty nucleocapsids. And then once the virus DNA is in the capsid and cleaved, the capsid changes conformation and seals in the DNA, and then it's ready to be 
pa um, packaged in, in, in an envelope. So the envelopment and egress process is still kind of an area of, of research that isn't, hasn't been fully defined. There's three models in, in existence. Um, probably the most likely being that it buds through the nuclear membrane in some fashion. Um, there is this model that it gets out through an enlarged nuclear pore, but there's less evidence for that. Um, so depending on which one happens, it can be either enveloped into the nuclear membrane and then de-enveloped and then transferred out to the Golgi where it gets wrapped again and then gets released through the secretory vesicles. Or it could be that the virus is getting in, getting enveloped, and then just getting released through a vesicle that transits out and releases the envelope virus. So one of these two mechanisms is probably the most likely, most likely probably this particular model. But again, that's kind of an area that's up for debate still. Um, <clears throat> So just to kind of summarize the entire process, again, we have uh, binding at the surface, transit to the, to the nucleus, replication, uh, concomitant with um, gene expression, packaging, envelopment, and release. And again, this usually analytic stage results in cell destruction. Once you get enough virus being made, the cell just can't survive any longer. But for some periods of time, the cell might just continue to pump out virus before it actually dies, or the virus might re-enter latency and not kill the cell. So. So in regards to latency, um, after infection of target cells, the virus is uh, uh, capable of entering this latent state. Um, with viruses like HSV1 and 2 and VZV, the alphas, they infect neurons. Uh, the beta herpes viruses like CMV infect myeloid lineage, and then um, EBV and KSHV, which are gammas, infect um, B lymphocytes mainly uh, in, in the host. And in this stage, there's no active virus production. Um, the lytic gene expression is turned off or re repressed. There's a small subset of latency genes that are expressed, um, and which we'll talk about more. But the genome is, is maintained as the circular episome, and it's just kind of in a quiescent state, just kind of hanging out there. Um, and, and kind of an important thing to note is that one of the factors that seems to keep the virus from fully reactivating in an immunocompetent host is the immune system uh, continually regulating cells that are reactivating virus or killing those cells and keeping the virus from fully reactivating and coming out again. So there's this interplay between the virus uh, trying to maintain itself and replicate and then the immune system kind of trying to keep it from coming out again. So that's another reason why they're very interesting viruses because of these interactions with the host. Um, and at some point, you can have environmental triggers, um, various things, uh, depending on which virus, UV exposure, immunosuppression, various things. Those things aren't really well defined as regards to mechanisms. But this can trigger reactivation, um, which causes the virus to come out again, replicate, and causes the host to produce more virus, um, which can then be spread to more unsuspecting individuals. Um, so in some cases, though, you can have uh, asymptomatic shedding. So you might not even know that you're shedding whatever virus you have. Um, and in some cases, you may develop a more severe disease. But generally, for things like HSV-1, you'll get a cold sore again, uh, which can reappear. But there might be periods where you're actually shedding virus, not have a visible cold sore, and still be passing virus to other people. Um, VZV, um, in the case of, of this virus, you get, initially get chickenpox. Um, it establishes latency. And then the virus can reactivate later to cause uh, shingles um, in usually elderly people, but um, also immunosuppressed people. So it can be broadly broken down into three stages. Um, establishment, in which the virus gets in, finds a cell to infect, and, and, and infects that cell. Maintenance, in which the virus then kind of keeps itself in the cell and keeps itself from reactivating. And then reactivation, again, with some trigger, environmental stimulus or trigger that causes the virus to then induce the lytic replication cycle. And this is a really an intense area of research. Um, there's various mechanisms that could be at play um, that cause a virus to come and reactivate itself. Um, so it's, it's something that a lot of people are very interested in still and things we still don't know a lot about. So as far as latency genes, again, there's only a few things being expressed in these cells. Um, there's these latency-associated transcripts, or LATs. These are three RNAs that are expressed during latency, um, 8.3 2KB and 1.45 KB um, transcripts. They're transcribed from the, um, the, uh, eight, uh, the latency promoter in the B repeat region. And it's kind of interesting because there's no proteins made from these um, transcripts that we know of. And the exact function actually is, still remains unknown. Nobody really knows what they're doing. But they're, they're always in an infected, latently infected cell. 
Some people hypothesize that they're antisense to genes like ICP0 and ICP34.5 that can then bind to these transcripts and prevent their translation. Um, or they might be involved in somehow preventing cell death or apoptosis. They're just there. We don't really know exactly what they're doing. So a lot of people are very interested in trying to decipher what exactly these, these transcripts are doing. So just a general overview of, of what this kind of looks like. So you get primary infection in an epithelial cell, which could be in um, the oral mucosa or the genital mucosal surfaces. You get replication in these cells. <clears throat> the virus is then able to get out and infect a nearby innervating uh, sensory neuron. And you get retrograde transport of viral capsids to the nucleus of the neuron. Um, the virus then establishes latency in the neuronal cell bodies in the ganglia. And then that's where the virus kind of sits. Uh, it sits in those neuronal bot cell bodies in the, in the nucleus. There's no active virus production. But again, at some point uh, during your life, there's some kind of trigger that happens, whether that's an immune um, immunosuppression or some kind of uh, environmental stimulus that triggers that. It causes the virus to turn itself back on again. The virus then makes more of itself, and then these capsids travel uh, through anterograde transport back out down the neuron back to the surface cells where they infected, or at least near to where they infected, um, which gives you an outbreak of cold sores or um, shingles in the case of varicella zosters. So HSV1 and HSV2. Um, HSV1, again, is mainly oral facial lesions like cold sores. Um, it can also cause ocular herpes um, in severe cases and, and potentially encephalitis if it gets into the brain. Um, and these viruses establish latency in the neurons of the trigeminal ganglia and the facial region, and that's kind of where they stay um, for the rest of your life. Um, HSV2, or genital herpes, establishes latency in the neurons of the sacral ganglia at the base of the spine. Um, although it is possible for HSV1 to infect the oral facial region and HSV1 to infect the genital region, so they're not totally strictly um, in one area. Yeah? When you get reactivation of the neurons mm -hmm. also Yeah, for, from what we know, they, um, they pretty much stay intact. I don't, it doesn't really lead to cell destruction. Um, it's, it's kind of an intriguing thing because nobody really knows why, I guess. I mean, you're making virus. It, it's potential there that it could, but for the most part, they seem to stay healthy. I mean, they're kind of serving as a reservoir for the virus still. So, um, But the triggers that induce that are really not known. And, you know, the, the role of VP16 and... and if it's actually being produced in there and if it's required, because it's a different mechanism than what you see with the normal infection at the surface. So it's really an interesting question, though. And one that if we could figure out, maybe we could cure some of these diseases. But, um. So varicella zoster virus, which is the chickenpox virus, um, its latency and reactivation is a kind of a similar process, and except in this case, you're getting chickenpox um, on your body. Those, um, the virus in those cells then transits through the neurons to the dorsal root ganglia, um, and then again, it stays quiescent in these cells. There's some triggering event later in life, um, generally in elderly people where the immune systems are starting to kind of wane a little bit, or if immunosuppression happens, or some other illness that maybe you're not aware of, triggers this virus to reactivate, and then you get transit of the virus back to the surface, which causes shingles or, or zoster, which is a pretty painful disease to, to get. So now kind of uh, talking less about the, the alpha herpes viruses, um, Epstein-Barr virus is a gamma herpes virus. So this is a virus. Um, it's a 180 kb genome, 84 genes. It's a common pathogen. It infects pretty close to 95% of the population. Most primary infections occur um, in childhood. They're generally asymptomatic. <coughs> um, primary infection in adolescence or adulthood can cause infectious mononucleosis or mono, the kissing disease. Um, but it's also associated with several human cancers. Um, um, they're not very frequent, but they do occur. Um, the virus initially infects and replicates in the epithelial cells of the oral mucosa, uh, which results in shedding in the saliva. That's how you pass it to other people. Um, and then secondarily, it infects the resting B lymphocytes in the oral mucosa um, by binding to CD21 and MHC class 2, which is on the surface of the B cells. This usually results in um, destruction of some of the infected B cells by CD8 T cells, which causes symptoms of mono. It's actually the destruction of the cells and changes in the cytokine profiles that cause you to get really sick. Um, and then once the immune system's kind of brought this under control, 
it establishes lifelong latent infection in infected B cells, and then it remains in your B cells in your body, floating around for the rest of your life. Occasionally, you get reactivation and shedding. Again, you may not know that you're shedding the virus. You may not have any symptoms of disease, um, but you could be passing it to other people that are not infected. So looking at the genome of EBV, uh, it's flanked by these terminal repeats on the ends, and it's got these uh, reiterated internal short repeats throughout that are different from the, the, the end terminal repeats. Um, it also has these three origins of replication, um, ORI lit, which is lytic replication. There's two of those. And then there's one called ORI P, which is a latent replication, which uses the cellular DNA replication machinery, which is different than what we see with HSV-1, because HSV-1 is infecting neurons, which don't replicate. But in this case, EBV is infecting a, a cell type that replicates, so it has to have some way to replicate its DNA when the cell divides. Otherwise, it would get diluted out and be lost from the cells over time. <clears throat> so it also encodes these uh, Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigens, or EBNAs, EBNA1, 2, 3A, 3B, 3C, LP. Um, these are all produced from a large transcript that's differentially spliced um, from the, the promoters, of the latent promoters. And their role is in latent genome replication and segregation during cell division. Uh, in particular, EBNA1 is, is involved in this. And they activate the expression of these other genes called latent membrane proteins, um, as well as cellular gene expression. So the latent membrane proteins, uh, LMP1, 2A, and 2B, actually activate cellular signaling pathways. So they kind of take over the host cell and turn on cellular signaling <coughs> pathways as a way to promote the cell survival, as well as turning on the cell to, to replicate itself so the virus can then um, kind of proliferate more and expand. Um, they also encode these other small viral RNAs, Epstein-Barr encoded RNAs, Ebers, and microRNAs that can regulate viral and cellular genes. So once it infects and productively replicates in the oral cells, again, it gets into B cells. And there's three stages of latency after it infects B cells. The first stage, confusingly being called latency three, which I wish they were flipped around, but they're not. Uh, latency three, you have expression of all of the latency genes. Uh, rapid proliferation of the B cells and expansion of the B cells. Many of these cells, again, are killed by cytotoxic T cells that recognize viral proteins. And then eventually it transfers to this latency 2, which um, there's less viral protein expression, less of the viral proteins are being made, the latency proteins. There's still some proliferating cells, but this then switches to latency 1, in which you only have expression of one uh, um, latent protein, EBNA1, which kind of allows the virus to hide from the immune system. It's not producing as much um, viral protein that the cell or the, the, the host might recognize as an infected cell. So it's kind of a way to keep the virus in the cell, but keep it hidden away so that the immune system can't recognize it. Um, and then again, latent genome replication and segregation via OREP occurs with EBNA1. So it's a way to kind of keep the virus um, from getting diluted out as these B cells divide. So occasionally, the cells will enter the lytic replication cycle again and cause the production and release of more virus. Um, this is just kind of a depiction of the overview of all of the, the latency stages. So you initially get infection of the oral epithelium in a resting B lymphocyte, and then you go through the stages of latency, uh, rapid proliferation of the cells, symptoms of mono happen in this, this area, kind of turning off of some of the latency genes, less proliferation. They eventually establish these memory B cells, which kind of hang out in the bloodstream and just kind of float around. And at some point, um, again, triggers can reactivate these, the virus to, to come out, and it converts the cells to plasma cells, um, producing more virus, releasing the virus, which then can reinfect the epithelium and then spread. So. so these latent membrane proteins are, are pretty cool in that they, <coughs> they mimic the functions of B cell signaling proteins. Uh, the LMPs activate cellular signaling pathways in infected B cells. Similar to the B cell protein CD40, they kind of converge on similar pathways. And these turn on uh, things like cell survival and proliferation. So it's, it's, it's a mechanism the virus uses again to kind of take over the cell and keep the cell in a state that allows the virus to be maintained. <clears throat> and then we have this other LMP, LMP2A, which mimics some of the signaling pathways that are triggered by the B cell receptor itself. Uh, which function in anti-apoptotic mechanisms and cell survival, so keeping the cell alive even though it's infected, kind of battling the, the virus and, or the host from, from clearing the virus from the host. Um, so in some cases, though, as with many cancers, uh, expression of genes which trigger 
these types of pathways can lead to loss of growth control and the development of B cell cancers. So EBV, uh, in addition to its you know, typical diseases like mono, is also associated with uh, cancers like Burkitt's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, this is actually the, the, the cancer in which this virus was discovered. It was initially discovered in Burkitt's lymphoma cells. So another virus, gamma herpes virus, which is related to EBV, which again, our lab is, is interested in and, and work on, is KSHV or, or HHV8, which is a human cancer associated virus. Um, it causes Kaposi's sarcoma skin lesions, which is this image here. It's the, the most common AIDS associated cancer. Um, it also infects B cells and can cause B cell campers, cancers and B cell lymphomas. And, and then again, kind of like EBV, again, um, these are very interesting viruses and they possess numerous genes that regulate a wide array of cellular processes. Uh, they're really good at blocking the development of the host immune response, inducing cellular prol proliferation, inhibiting cell death, just as a way to keep the cell alive and keep the virus um, inside the cells. And then even more intriguing to me is the fact that many of these genes share significant sequence homology to cellular genes. Uh, some of these being the viral interferon regulatory factor homologs. There's a viral interleukin-6 homolog, which is involved in B cell proliferation. Uh, a viral IL-8 receptor homolog, which also is involved in proliferation and survival. And these are basically thought to have been pirated from the host genome during evolution and adapted by the virus during evolution. So at some point, these genes have recombined into the KSHV genome. They've been modified over thousands of years to help the virus uh, survive and pr promote viral replication and persistence in the host. Um, um, but again, in some cases, these viruses, we have expression of some of these genes. They can cause um, lack of immune clearance, and especially in cases like AIDS, can lead to the development of cancers because of this effect on um, cellular growth properties. So this is just depicting a KSHV-infected cell with um, the KSHV IL-8 receptor on the surface. Um, and then again, this triggers signaling pathways that are uh, common to inducing um, proliferation, growth, and survival. And then the IL-6 homolog that's encoded by this virus also then stimulates uh, the IL-6 receptor, which induces B cells to proliferate. So the virus is kind of taking over the cell to keep the cell growing. Right. Yeah. If we, you do phylogeny, do you see that these are intrinsically related to each other? So the KSHV homolog or the or, you know, functional homolog, yeah. are they actually truly homologous in terms of the sequence? To the or cellular or? proteins? Yeah. yeah. They're close. A lot of them are, are different. I, I know I used to work on this particular one. Um, it's similar to CXCR1, which is a cellular chemokine receptor. Um, so its homology is about... 40 to 50 percent, which isn't very high, but functionally, it's very, very much the same. Um, it's actually adapted itself to not require um, any kind of um, binding of any kind of um, chemokine or ligand at all. So it's just constantly on, but it inserts itself into the membrane and just kind of constitutively activates these signaling pathways. So, um, yeah, but and the IL-6 protein is, is only like 20% homologous, but it's still capable of binding to and activating the IL-6 receptor, yeah. Is that at all related to this one being particularly associated with cancer, or it's just always on? Yeah, well, that's one of the main theories. There's numerous genes in this particular virus. I mean, probably easily 30 genes that are associated with being involved in cancer. This is one of the main things a lot of people have looked at. This is another molecule. Um, anything that subverts the host, um, cell or makes it grow in any fashion. Yeah, so there's actually quite a few genes that could be involved. And it could be a combination of all of these. It might not just be one particular gene that's triggering the cancer, but um, yeah. So again, as, I, as I've mentioned, these viruses are really good at blocking the immune, uh, immune response, preventing detection and clearance in the host. Some mechanisms um, are, are things like blocking the interferon response in infected cells. Uh, HSV1, the VHS degrades the mRNAs associated with the interferon pathway. Uh, KSHV, again, has these VRF proteins that block activation of interferon-regulated genes. And then they're also really good at inhibiting the presentation of peptides by MHC class 1 on the cell surface, which prevents recognition and killing by cytotoxic CD8 T cells. Um, again, HSV1 encodes ICP47, um, which is one of the first molecules that was recognized as a viral protein that blocks MHC class 1 presentation. 
KSHV encodes two, CMV has at least four, um, and there's various mechanisms that are employed besides this that uh, um, affect a wide variety of the immune response um, in the host, um, anywhere from antigen presentation to complement activation. Um, there's a huge list of things that it does. So in terms of blocking MHC peptide presentation to cytotoxic CD8 T cells, so normally in an infected cell, you get a digestion of some of the viral proteins by the protease. It gets loaded into MHC class one, taken to the surface, and presented to CD8 T cells, which then bind to uh, these peptides and result in killing of the infected cell. Um, but in the case of herpes viruses, again, we have mul multiple mechanisms at play that actually prevent this peptide from getting properly ex expressed and, and presented on the surface. Again, ICP-47 blocks, it blocks this protein called TAP, which is basically a, a transporter that takes these little viral peptide proteins, stuffs them into the MHC class one, and then lets it get to the surface. So the ICP-47 actually blocks this, this molecule, prevents the peptide from getting loaded, and then prevents the cell from being recognized by the CD8 T cells. And then again, there's other viruses that have other mechanisms from basically dragging the MHC back um, from the surface or preventing it from transiting all the way through the ER and Golgi, um, just keeping the MHC class one from functioning in its normal state. So for the last, uh, last part of this, I just wanted to kind of talk about some of the new stuff that's happening with using herpes viruses as far as vaccine vectors go. Um, particular, the, the virus that everybody's using to kind of look into this is cytomegalovirus, or HHV5. Um, it's, again, a prevalent human pathogen. 40% to 70% of adults are infected, generally through uh, displaying a benign or asymptomatic infection. Um, it can be associated with disease. Again, fetal abnormalities can be associated with congenital infection. Um, it can cause disease in transplant recipients or immunosuppressed patients. Um, but for the most part, most of us probably have this virus, don't even know we have it, don't really have any symptoms from it that we're aware of. Um, so it seems to be sort of harmless in that it just kind of lives with us for our lives. Um, <clears throat> so there's been a focus on looking at CMV as a vaccine vector in humans, but to do this, we have to use an animal model. So one that's been developed is using um, rhesus CMV. So rhesus macaque monkeys are naturally infected with rhesus CMV. Around 95% of these monkeys have this virus. Uh, it's been well studied and well characterized, and it's essentially homologous to human CMV in regards to its genetic structure and a lot of the, the proteins that it encodes. And importantly, it's easily manipulated in vitro. You can use molecular cloning techniques to insert foreign genes into the rhesus CMV genome, which allows expression of uh, different antigens during virus infection. So you can make these viruses produce pretty much any protein that you can imagine. So it's being used, rhesus CMV is being used as a model to test CMV vaccine vector development for uh, numerous pathogens, um, including HIV, TB, malaria, Ebola, and the list is growing. Uh, this is uh, the rhesus CMV genome. You should memorize all of these open reading frames. <laughs> uh, just to show you how complex it is, there's, again, a large number of genes, lots of overlapping open reading frames. but. A lot of these are dispensable for normal replication. The, the virus doesn't really need them. So some of them can be deleted. Um, they can be mutated to actually make the virus grow differently. So there's some, some work being done to take out certain molecules that are involved in preventing um, the MHC class one downregulation and things like that. So you can really kind of tweak these viruses to do pretty much anything you can think of. Um, and they're also good for, against stuffing things into. You can put expression cassettes into the genomes um, um, pretty much anywhere you can think, as long as you're not disrupting anything that's critical to the virus. So we're, we're using rhesus CMV um, as, as a way to develop uh, vaccines by putting foreign antigens into the rhesus CMV genome. So this work's actually being done by um, Dr. Lewis Picker's lab at VGTI, um, also Klaus Fru, who, who is um, at VGTI, has helped develop a lot of this. Um, there's been some pretty important publications that have come out of, of Lewis's lab in the last few years that have gotten a lot of attention in regards to developing rhesus CMV um, as an HIV vaccine vector to test the ability to, to develop CMV as a vaccine vector for HIV. So it kind of in a nutshell, a brief summary of what they did is um, they took this um, SIV, which is simian immunodeficiency virus, which is the, the monkey homologue of HIV, um, made this cassette, which um, uh, expresses the GAG protein of, of SIV, inserted it into the rhesus CMV genome, 
these viruses are then packaged and produced and, and used to infect rhesus macaque monkeys. Um, and they initially just wanted to test to see if they could actually detect expression of this gag protein. They could detect it in vitro. They could also infect monkeys and found that they were able to detect expression of this protein in the monkeys. So the virus gets in, replicates like it normally would, and produces this um, foreign antigen um, that then is available for the immune system to recognize. So when they explored this further, they found that the, um, the rhesus CMV gag vector actually induces an SIV-specific CD8 T cell, cell response in the infected monkey. So it's doing what they were hoping it would do. It's actually generating an immune response against the foreign um, SIV peptides. So this is just kind of a summary of some of their data. Again, um, these monkeys expressed this, this antigen. They uh, were allowed to, they boosted them at several points, and then they um, exposed them to SIV to see if they had protection against SIV infection. Um, this is just displaying SIV viral loads on the side here. And what it basically shows is that um, about 50% of the animals that are infected with the, uh, the gag expressing vector actually show protection against SIV infection whereas in the unvaccinated controls, um, there really is no protection provided, um, as you would imagine, to SIV because they have not experienced the, the gag protein. Um, and interestingly also is that there seems to be this unique CD8 T cell response that develops that's different from those that are seen with other vaccines that have been tried, other DNA vaccines and other viruses. Um, and it seems to be some attributes of the CMV itself, using it as a vector that allows it to have this enhanced protection uh, it's, it's thought that maybe some of the different genes in the genome are helping play a role in getting the antigen to different places that it normally doesn't get to, or may help the, the antigen get to different cell types that normally don't get infected by SIV that allows it then to be exposed to the immune system better. Or another thought also being that since this virus is basically going to be with you forever, now you're getting these kind of short bursts of reactivation and expression of uh, the SIV gag protein that might kind of provide a boost of antigen over time, which kind of keeps your immunity up, prevents you from getting infected. So this is really promising work. Um, it's preferring to enter human phase one clinical trial, trials for our HCMV, for human CMV. So there's still a long way to go in regards to getting this into humans, but the animal work has really provided um, some strong evidence that this could be a new method to prevent SIV infection. And then, yeah. Uh -huh. The whole idea, though, of this infection process, mm -hmm. they, as you mentioned, the recent attacks were 95% infected already. Right. Can you super infect? Yes. Can you actually then infect yep. one that's already yep. infected? You okay. can. That was a big thing. That's what they first tested. Can we reinfect animals that are positive? And they found that they could reinfect. Um, so it doesn't seem to be a hindrance at all. You can basically just keep infecting them with different CMBs, and they still get infected. So. Presumably, because the CMB somehow is right. reducing the immune response. Yeah. CMV, yeah. and so you can kind of use that Correct. as a prologue to yeah, get into it. Exactly. So. Yeah. I mean that was that was probably one of the main hurdles to all of this is like can we even reinfect animals that are already positive? So and of course there's also the caveats of, you know, this virus is associated with bad things sometimes. So who are you gonna are you gonna expose to this vaccine? Like you're gonna have to be really selective about who receives the vaccine and who doesn't. Um, so those are things that all have to be obviously fine-tuned and worked out before we start injecting humans with CMV vectors. So, um, But then just another, another virus, Ebola, obviously, has been kind of a hot topic lately. There's another um, <coughs> former colleague from the VGTI who is now at another institution, but um, his group has tested using CMV, rhesus CMV, as a, as a vaccine vector for Ebola. So they kind of did a similar process where they put GP1 and GP2 from Ebola into rhesus CMV, made virus, infected animals and then challenge them, actually challenge them with Ebola, which is pretty severe um, work conditions. But they found that 80% uh, of the animals that received the Ebola uh, CMV um, vaccine actually were protected from Ebola infection. So again, this is all really promising uh, work. Uh, again, a lot has to be done before it's finalized and everything kind of comes to fruition. But it's, it's definitely been something that has been really looked on as a favorable, favorable way to potentially have new vaccines against some really nasty things, so. And I guess that's, that's it. I mean, I won't go through all of this. I'll just leave that with you. Um, obviously, I think herpes viruses are really cool. They do a lot of stuff. I probably could have added more slides to this, but um, hopefully I didn't overwhelm you with information or anything. But um, if you have any specific questions that you can ask now, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Was that what? Oh, how it works? I'm, I think it's just through like actin and the cellular machinery, but I mean, I don't know the specific um, mechanisms of how the virus binds to what and gets to where, but so it just travels up and down. Any, it seems like that would treat the virus a certain specific area for the wrong time. So is that yeah. sort of why you see more in these specific areas, or is that really related? I mean, I guess that's kind of always the question is like, does it always come out in exactly the same spot? Right. Um, theoretically, yes, but I mean, it's possible that it's also infecting other neurons. You maybe didn't have an initial lesion there, and it's the neurons aren't next to each other, but they're coming out in different spots or close to it. And then it also has to travel from that neuron to neighboring cells. So it's probably not always going to be exactly the same cells or whatever, but it's going to be in that localized region where that neuron kind of comes out. Anything else? Yeah? Do the isoforms of the genome for HSV1, mm -hmm. do they have any, do they have a specific effect? You mean, do, do they? they versus each other? No, they're essentially the same. Okay. Um, it's just more of a phenomenon of they can functionally be in any, any orientation, they still work the same way. So they're all equally infectious. They all cause the same kind of disease. Um, they just can kind of flip around. Yeah. That doesn't no, not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah? I missed the beginning mm -hmm. of all this. That's fine. I have, so I have this really nice face paint right here. Um, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> are there vaccines for herpes, or do they just not really go into it because it doesn't really work? There are for some, like VZV, which works very well, chicken pox. Um, but other viruses are a little more tricky. Like HSV-1, there isn't a vaccine for that. So. Um, and it's hard because they're, they're avoiding the immune system, so you really have to find something that can get around that. For VZV, it works really well. You basically get a live attenuated virus. You don't get chicken pox, um, and it's been really, really nice to have that, obviously. So. But for other herpes viruses, like CMV, there isn't a vaccine yet. People are working on things, but making a vaccine against the herpes virus is hard. Using it as a vaccine vector is easy, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Get right. They, it can't produce Theoretically, no, and it's very rare. I was actually just reading about some of this recently. Um, usually, once you've been infected, no matter what strain you get infected with again, you don't get chicken pox again. But there's rare cases where people can get a more mild form of chicken pox. Usually, it's not as severe as the first time you get it. But usually, once you've been infected, your immunity is against pretty much any varicella strain that you see. Um, but occasionally there's been rare observed cases where people might actually get infected with two different strains of, at the same time or something really weird. So, but for the most part, no. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's just a question. Sure. I, I was trying to follow as best I could. Yeah. Um, BP16, is that a transcriptional activator or is that? It's an activator. It's mm -hmm. only an activator. Yeah. So it, it has this transcriptional activation domain that's really good at recruiting all of the, the proteins from the, the RNA polymerase complex. Um, so it, it doesn't directly bind DNA. It actually needs the HCF1 and OCT1 to land at the promoter. And it's sort of a, I guess maybe you could call it a co-activator or something, right. but it's definitely um, strictly involved in transcriptional activation. Yeah. Anything else? Curious, you mentioned early on that uh, it seemed it's probably co-evolved. I guess obviously it's immune system interaction for yeah. a very long period of time. Is there any evidence of, of cross-species kind of infection? You mentioned again the rhesus CMV versus mm -hmm. the human CMV. Right. Is so it just seem, they just seem to be human right. or whatever specific animal is always in that? Situation? That is usually they're very species specific, yeah. usually. But there are cases, one in particular working with primates that we're always aware of is herpes B, which is an alpha herpes virus that can infect humans and it can kill you. So you have to be extremely aware of animals that could have herpes B. Um, it's a neurotropic virus and there's actually documented cases of researchers being infected by, unknowingly being infected by herpes B and dying from it. So um, that can happen, but mostly like if you take 
human CME and try to infect a primate, it doesn't work. It's just dead in the water. Same with KSHV. You can't infect monkeys with KSHV. It just doesn't happen. So usually they're very species specific, but there are cases where there's a, a barrier jump between a species and you can actually have infection. So. No, yeah, the monkeys, like us, just carry it. They don't seem to have any overt symptoms, which is kind of one of the problems is we don't really know if the monkey's infected or not because it doesn't display any symptoms of disease. But if you get bit by a monkey that has it or something, then you could be in trouble, so. Do you see a lot of, like, in an abnormal host, an atypical host, mm -hmm. do you see these you know, like panic responses by the viruses and other so on that aren't, don't fit with their usual cycle? probably a combination of all of that. I mean, it's not really known. Um, it, it's pretty complex. It could be any you know, difference in your immunity or it could be something the virus is doing differently that maybe we don't know about. So I don't really know the specific answer, but it's possible, yeah. Yeah? So would herpes disease be transmissible between human hosts? Generally, it'd be a dead end type infection because you're gonna get really sick from it. Um, and well, I mean, it could be, but hopefully if you find a person that's got herpes B and you know, then they're gonna be put away somewhere where <laughs> they're not gonna be out exposing people. But I don't think there's any documented cases of human to human transmission, because it's usually a pretty quick disease, so. Most likely. I mean, I can't really say specifically, but I don't know. Obviously, the virus still is still using it, so it must be functionally important or something the virus uses or needs because otherwise those probably would have been deleted at some point. So. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... So it just has extra cost. Right. And again, that nobody really knows if that's just an artifact of the duplication or maybe that having two copies is important. So that's a good question that maybe you can answer. <laughs> Sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you.